Hi, everyone. We're going to give uh, people a few minutes to join us. Thanks for coming. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Peter. I see. Oh, and hi, Diane. <laughs> hi. Hi, Lee. Hey, hey, who, who's that? Oh, Peter. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? I'm, Hello. I'm good, thanks. Yeah, hi, Mom. We're both here. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Joe Cottonwood, hi. Ellen, is so that you, to Ellen? See you all. Oops, I'm trying to see people here. Ah, there we go. Hi, Monica. Hi, Lee. Hi. Hi, hi. Hi, Diane. Hi, Joe. Diane. I see lots of new people. I know. I've made so many new friends zooming around the Bay Area. Yeah, yeah. it's good to have you back, Louise. Thank you. Hi, Peter. Hi. We'll just give it another minute or so to allow for more people to join us. Hi, Lisa. I feel so much better about my piles of books and papers when I see other people's rooms. <laughs> <laughs> You're not seeing the half of it. Um, Total mess. I kind of have a, a, a screen thing, not the book. I'm act not actually in a cave, um, but I can't remember how to like turn off the picture. I usually use the Zoom meeting for caving group. So the cave background works out great, but <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> But it's it's but books and bookshelves would be much more appropriate for the poetry Zoom. There is a way that you can deselect the um, yeah. virtual background. And yeah, I know there's a way. I just haven't looked for. It. It's like you. I think you have to log on to Zoom or something like in. I'm not sure. It used to be that you had to set it up one way or the other before you got on, but they've made so many updates and things mm. have become easier that I'm not sure you might be able to do it on the fly now. Yeah, maybe before the next one. I was gonna check it out, but then uh, we had to walk the dog and so no time to check, but so. 
I guess it's 6.33 by my computer. We can get started. If everyone's, all the poets are ready. Okay, so. They are. Oh, someone is sharing instructions on how to change your Zoom background if you want to. Well, get my speech ready. Okay, so uh, happy Poetry Month. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is our second poetry reading party. If you couldn't make it to the first one, uh, I can share the link to the recording from our Zoom, uh, our Zoom, our YouTube channel. Uh, but today we'll be listening to poetry from Lee Rossi, Joe Cottonwood, Monica Corday, Tony Press, and Hilary Cruz Mejia. Uh, after the recital, we'll have a panel discussion between the poets. So please feel free to post your questions in the chat. Uh, we still have a haiku writing workshops if you want to sign up uh, this Friday, April 16th and 20th. And I'll post the links in the chat again. Uh, if you would like to access live closed captioning for this event, you can click on the CC icon in the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Okay, and without further ado, I'll introduce our first poet, who is uh, Lee Rossi. So Lee Rossi is the winner of the Jack Grapes Poetry Prize and a finalist for the Steve Cowett Prize. His latest book is Darwin's Garden from Moontide Press. Uh, his individual poems have appeared in the Southwest Review, Rattle, Spillway, the Chiron Review, and the Southern Review. Southern Review. He is a member of the Northern California Book Reviewers and a contributing editor to the Poetry Flash. Well, thank you, Jenna. And thank everybody for signing into this. This is very nice to see all of you, many of my friends. Okay, so I have, uh, I have five poems. This is your five poem warning. Uh, but before I start reading my poems, I, I'd like to invoke the shade of a, a master of the macabre, poet James Tate. Um, I'm sure you all know him. Uh, his words embody my own conviction even though I was raised during the heyday of confessionalism. He says, I knew from the moment I started writing that I never wanted to be writing about my life. I think those are good words to follow and I've tried to follow them as best I can. Um, my first poem is from um, my second book, uh, Ghost Diary, it's called Borrowed Light. You see those clouds? I wish the sky would swallow them like dumplings. And the spaghetti strands left by jets, those two. I don't care if the sky is just a bowl filled with static. It has a job to do, clearing a space for night so the moon can burst forth, a flower riding a stem of light, parting the grave hours into the sea of departure and the sea of return. Sun god and moon goddess, you remember them, those silent movie stars his purring convertible, her chauffeured limousine. Do you think they still have gifts to give? Who doesn't remember her warmth, his chill intelligence? Sometimes I feel that I am their chosen insect, hopping from day to night to day. Just look at my wings, dividing light into its many selves. If I'm nothing, I guess I wanna be their nothing not the nothing of the daily news and the daily commute. I made my choice. I can't remember how long ago. Maybe that's what it means to be chosen. And here I am, brilliant, hurtful, suspicious, and beloved, dark body reflecting some distant, unapproachable light. Okay. I'm still struggling to figure out what that means. Uh, for a long time, I lived in Los Angeles, and I, I'm sure that has something to do with my interest in movies and producers and poetry. Um, my next poem is called Pantomime. That's like pantoum and pantomime. Um, it is a pantoum, and it's from my third book, Wheelchair Samurai. A producer took my pantoum to lunch. He's on his own now and needs a free meal. At least that's what he says, and he talks a lot. He's got this compulsion to repeat himself. He's on his own now, so he needs a free meal and someone to listen while he complains about his compulsion to repeat himself. 
It's hard for him to meet girls when all he wants is someone to listen while he complains about being the river that runs beneath the river. It's hard to meet girls when all they want is a pretty boy gazing in a pool where the river that runs beneath the river suddenly surfaces. He wants to say, quote, I'm more than a pretty boy gazing in a pool. I'm the shadow that refuses to lie down and suddenly surfaces in what you say. I'm the reverses you suffer looking in a mirror, the shadow, there I go again, that refuses to lie down, the echo when you have nothing to say. You suffer, don't you, when you look in the mirror and there's nothing to say, not even an echo. That's what he said he said, and he talks a lot, the producer who took my pantoum to lunch. Okay. Next poem is, uh, I started writing a lot of uh, prose poems. And so this is a little prose poem. Um, has another one of those strange titles. It's called A Mandatory. The girl's name Amanda and Mandatory. I met Amanda sketching a panda at the National Zoo. It was a bitter cold morning, colder than it ever gets in the mountains of China where the panda's ancestors lived. But the panda seemed happy enough, chewing bright green bamboo grown especially for her somewhere beyond the capital's sprawling suburbs and rushed to the zoo. If the panda had any idea of the immense efforts spent on keeping her alive, she would have dropped dead of shame. Amanda was so absorbed in her drawing that she didn't notice me admiring it. It was the living panda, that was clear, but cobbled together from other images, a long distance tractor trailer, nuclear power stations, storefronts and national monuments, creating a panda mosaic whose form and texture was pure panda. Amanda herself I now saw was similarly composed of disparate elements, liquid aspirin, hair dye, tooth whitening gel, and thousands of other products the pa panda's grandparents had never imagined. But then so was I. A remarkable unlikeness, I said, breaking the ice, warm air rushing from my mouth. She looked up, looked at me, then back at the drawing, as if trying to incorporate what I had just said into it. Would you like me to do your portrait, she asked. The rest, as they say, is story. I forgot to mention that's from my last book, Darwin's Garden. Okay, so I lied. Here's a poem where I'm writing about my life. Um, one, a jillion years ago, I used to play Little League Baseball. So this is called Sacrifice Fly. Like sleepers roused too early, bugs stumble into the new grass, flexing their unpracticed limbs and wings each year earlier than the last. And yet they are as beautiful as ever, glossy, iridescent, or, or matte black. Like everything new, they snatch our attention. This little guy, buzzing on the sill, desperately trying any way out, just a minute ago was desperate to find a way in. Is it instinct, judgment, or cunning that rouses this demented earnestness? In a day or two, he'll be nothing but husk, brushed away by the softest touch. As a child, I feared every insect, caterpillars, beetles, bees, wasps, even mosquitoes and ants. I'd wait in the Amazonia of right field for some looping ball magically accelerated into that little used corner of the outfield to bend my way, scratching my ankles and in step the whole time. Enough sulfur, my mother's gift, in my socks to cover my legs to the knees. I took my exile with good humor, cheering my more athletic teammates and steadfastly belittling our opponents. No batter, no batter, no batter, cricketed the chatterbox and right. And yet I felt lonely out there, just me, the chiggers and fireflies, the suffocating humidity, humidity and the moon arching overhead, 
patiently nearing its apogee, taunting me to measure my patience with its own. Okay. And then one last poem. This is fairly new. Um, I love stories. I, uh, I'm a late come father, so I spend a lot of time reading um, Grimm and other kinds of children's stories to my kids. And so they kind of infil re-infiltrated my consciousness. This is called The Further Adventures of Pooh, you know, like Pooh Bear. When he was a cub, Pooh's mother always used to say, eat what you want, just don't eat all the honey. Pooh was an obedient yet often unsatisfied cub. But I want all the honey, he said to himself, something he never said to his mother who weighed 700 pounds and had a black nose and black tufts at the tips of her ears. Perhaps because she was a single mom, she indulged Pooh more than other mother bears might. Whenever there was a little extra money for a honey pot, she let Pooh eat first. And Pooh, a careful cub, made sure to leave at least a little in the bottom of the jar. One day, Pooh was wandering the hundred acre wood looking for his pals, Rue or Tigger, or even that pain of an ass. He wandered so far, in fact, that he got lost. Eventually, he came to a huge house and being an enterprising and hungry cub, he climbed the porch, knocked on the door, and not hearing any response, tried the door. He was not surprised when, with barely a shove, the door opened. Nobody in his part of the Hundred Acre Wood locked their doors, not even Owl, who had some pretty expensive stuff. That telescope, for example, which was worth at least five honey pots. That's what his mom said. And this place, so large and comfortable, was sure to have pots and pots of honey. The police report noted that 23 empty honey pots were found strewn about the kitchen floor along with the unconscious cub. The owners of the house, a family of grizzlies, refused to press charges. One of their young was in honey rehab. But since this was the second break in in as many weeks, they added additional locks to all the doors, engaged a security firm, and bought a mastiff large enough to repel any intruder. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lee. Uh, let me, I will introduce uh, our next poet is Joe Cottonwood. Uh, one of Joe Cottonwood's poems was recently displayed on a nine foot tall oops, sorry, billboard in the Kew Gardens in London, England. He is widely published around the world with Random Saints as his latest book of poetry, popular novels, and the award-winning memoir, 99 Jobs, Blood, Sweat, and Houses. To support his writer's habit, uh, his writing habit, he's repaired hundreds of houses as a contractor. Joe lives with his high school sweetheart in La Honda. Here's Joe. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jenna. Am I coming through all right? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, let me... Um, I'm going to start out with a poem that I just wrote a week ago, um, but it's suddenly strangely uh, relevant. Um, I've never read it before to anyone, but I want to dedicate this to all the Asian Americans among us, including among my own family. Um, I want you to know you enrich and enliven our culture. This particular poem is about a dentist named Dr. Song, S-O-N-G, Song. It's called A Dentist in America. Dr. Song mumbles, does not sing, telling me he was an orphan in Korea. He fills two teeth and prepares one crown, grumbling all the while that my beard, which he calls shrubbery, is in the way. My cavities are too far back in my mouth. My tongue is too big and always seeking his fingers, and my teeth are too hard. At least I'm not boring. I wonder what his life was like as a teenager. My own teen years started bad as an outcast, ended good with a girlfriend. 
maybe his too, because he tells me he has a three-year-old daughter who will become a dentist like him. I'd advise him not to count on that, but I can't speak with his fingers between my lips, plus with massive Novocaine, I could only gurgle. Dr. Song is not good with people, but he's good people. And so is his daughter when she takes over the practice and laughs when I tell how her father would complain about my shrubbery. She says his feelings are holding just fine. She's pregnant, says it's a girl. That was one of my newest poems. Now here's one of my oldest poems. Um, some poems have a very short half-life and, and others just endure. And this, <laughs> this one endures. Um, it's been all over the world and republished and translated and so on. Anyway, it's called Redwood Prayer. It's very short. It's a poem in the form of a prayer. Redwood Prayer, grant me deep roots, solid branches, let the fires pass me by. Let generations of squirrels and blue jays hop on my limbs. Let me breathe fog, chew sunlight, and look down over centuries. I live in La Honda. I, 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 honestly, I, I live in California because of the redwoods. That's what drew me here in the first place. I grew up on the East Coast. And when I was seven years old, my best friend moved to California and sent me a postcard of a redwood tree that you could drive a car through. And I said, wow, I'm going to California. And I swear, that's been in my mind. And I, and here I am living under redwoods now. Okay, back to poetry. Um, 44 years ago, my son was born. A month before his sixth birthday, I wrote th this following poem. Now my son has a son who's age six. So it seems like the right time to read this. This is called Boy, Almost Six. You are five, or as you say, almost six. You have a toolbox, like me. You read books in bed, like me. You even make up poems, like me. I am 35, which is almost 40. I wish I could cry like you and scream at people when I'm angry like you and heal my wounds with a blanket like you. With your eyes through which I am learning to see, take in our redwood mountains, our blackberry hills, quick squirrels, Break for them, please, when you drive, when you're 16, which is almost 21. Learn to love moss and fat spiders. Feel the fungus feeding on decay. I am rotting, my son, as you feed on me, and I would have it no other way. So as, as, as uh, Jenna introduced me, I'm a contractor. I've repaired houses all my life um, to pay the bills. And it's, a lot of my poems arise from that uh, situation. Here's one from exactly that. Uh, it's called Lester and Maggie and the Four Wheel Bed. Gruff Gray Lester and Navajo Maggie have no offspring, but treat me like one. For Lester, I knock down a wall and install fat rubber wheels under the walnut monster of a double bed they've shared 60 years, so he can roll Maggie to the dining room and kitchen. Magpie of dawn, Lester says. She keeps an eye on me. Maggie's delighted, joking and chattering room to room, sometimes in Navajo, and you get used to the scent of urine. Rolling is difficult for Lester, 
who limps and later more cumbersome with oxygen tanks. So I'm replacing cupped floorboards when Maggie, who is watching me work, points to a pair of coyotes, one large wary male, one smaller calm female. Outside the window, sitting on haunches by the broken down tractor, staring right at us. Not unusual for a ranch house outside town, but then we hear a gurgling sound like water in a drain. Lester, a big man, leaps to Maggie's side, bends his head to her heart, while outside in broad daylight, those coyotes start to howl. The two, aroo! It tingles. The air itself seems to glow. Lester grabs his rifle from the wall and runs to the window, but those coyotes don't flinch. Aru! He lowers the gun with shaky hand. Then he says, they're calling her home. A couple weeks later, after the service, Lester, in his old wedding suit, tight and ragged, hands me a cardboard box containing the wheels he's removed. And there's a note for the next, help them go home. Now, I'm no coyote, but that box is on the top shelf in the garage. I'm telling you, son, so you'll know. I um I think I'll do one more poem. Um, we had it's it's kind of ironic in the um, in that Redwood Prayer po poem. I said, "Let the fires pass me by." Well, this summer the wildfires just missed me. I had to evacuate my house. Um, we were gone for over a week, and the fire stopped just on the other side of the road, um, the other side of Alpine Road down there. And we uh, we could come back, but it was it was a, then that was followed by weeks of smoke. And I, I'm sure those of you who were in the Bay Area remember that day in September when the drifting smoke of wildfires was like the darkest of storm clouds. It was like an oncoming tornado. It felt like, and it gave you the same sense of dread. And from indoors, if you looked out. The window, it, everything was black. It, if you went outside, it wasn't really complete night, but it was dark. And um, I had to drive to Half Moon Bay that day, so I had my headlights on, and all the, all the other cars had their headlights on because it was like night driving. And when I got to Half Moon Bay, I ran my errands. I mean, everyone's wearing face masks, and you could see their eyes. And what you could see in their eyes was a, a sense of fear. And, and a second sense, a sense of, we're all in this together. That let's forget our differences, whatever. I mean, there's this tremendous election going on at the time, but it, there was no sense of conflict between people. It was all, we're in this together and let's get through this. And I went right home and I, I, the same night I wrote this poem. It's called, One Day There Was No Day. One day there was no day, no birds sang at dawn because there was no dawn. We walked our dogs by flashlight. One day there was no sun. Through smoky veils, you could stare directly at a floating tangerine. One day there was no noon. Owls hooted, crickets chirped. Porch lights never dimmed. Deer wandered the streets, blinking tears of soot. If you can't count on day following night, what can you count on? One day there was no me, no you. One day we were we, scared, seeking touch. Please hold my hand. Yeah, that's it. Thanks.
Oh, that last one, I think we were just digesting it still. <laughs> oh, thank you, Joe. Uh, let me, this time I will add our next poet first. Ah, our next poet will be Monica Corday. Uh, Monica Corday, along with being a mainstay at local open mics, co-hosts the first Tuesday Poets Night. Uh, this year, she debuted as a featured reader with poetry groups from Half Moon Bay and Belmont. Her poetry is published online and in anthologies. Uh, besides writing, she loves hiking, horse riding, painting, ooh, and motorcycling the back roads of California with her husband. Uh, a former teacher of English and French, Monica is originally from India. Uh, thank you, Jenna. Uh, can you all hear me fine? Great. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, and we are finally here. I'm so grateful to the San Mateo County Libraries and to you for organizing and hosting this celebration of the National Poetry Month. Uh, you've been terrific all along, Jenna. Um, I'm also humbled and honored to be here to share um, the stage or the virtual page, if you may, uh, with this powerhouse of poets on the panel, Hillary, Tony, Joe, and Lee. Such a pleasure. And those who have joined in to listen to all of us tonight, uh, friends and family from all over, so wonderful to have you all. Uh, technology was always there, but uh, somehow the world seems much closer, closer than, uh, than it was before. There's actually this uh, phrase in Sanskrit, uh, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, which means the world is a family. And during the pandemic, um, shelter at home was certainly a privilege, but it was also a gift in some ways, uh, especially when I rediscovered the things that bring me joy. And one of, one of which was having my poetry family back in the virtual space. So here's the first poem I'd like to offer. In the Zoom Room. Nearing the end of a pandemic year, I can't say why, but this place is a comfort. I lean against the window behind me, my glance floating along the surface in gallery view. Matching names to their faces, I wait. A lone candle flickers in the far distance of someone's living room warms the hearth, part of my soul. And each one of us has only words to give. Our understories rumbling with conversations, with odes, villainels, a haiku, a dirge. Only by offering a verse, if the world can mend, what is it that holds us back? In distance, lies closeness, and I speak a poem under my breath. Hot, blue, and luminous word constellations whirling away in space, waiting for an outstretched hand to connect the dots, to make me whole again. It is so comforting to find the link that connects you with the other half of your kind where love and words are waiting to embrace you. And I feel blessed to be where I am right now. Thank you. Um, I wrote this next poem for the Women's History Month. Uh, it is a call, um, more like a challenge to unapologetically claim the many female forms we have been taught to dismiss and to accept each one in all of its femaleness. Dare. Himalayan goddess, eight-armed Shakti. I've heard stories of your power, penance and courage, of things you have sacrificed, slayed and survived. How you manifest into a Devi. Become Uma, Parvati, Durga, Kali. Provider, preserver, wife, goddess. Warrior, destroyer, mother, goddess. 
superhuman, divine, great goddess. For once, let go of the brilliance weighing you down. Reveal your unradiating self to our untamed eyes. Whoever you are, no matter what you're called, wrap your arms around these other versions of you. Free-willed woman, survivor woman, divorced, childless, rebel woman, lighting her own cigarettes woman, making her own mistakes woman, trapped in a man's body woman, unwomanly woman, flawed woman. Persist under these glorious pieces you hide. Announce your place in the pantheon of beings. Go ahead, woman. Ungoddess yourself. There. Thank you. Uh, I hope all of you are with me so far. Thank you. Uh, the next poem I'd like to share offers a different flavor of poetry. It is a pantoum poem. And my very, very first attempt at employing this Malaysian verse form. I hope you enjoy it. Motorcycle pantoum. It is only a machine, steel skin, rubber and plastic, pistons and valves and the crankshaft spinning free, keeping up with the beats, the rhythm on the road. And when I say heart, you know there is something more than pistons and valves and the crankshaft spinning free until finally the motor comes to life. And when I say heart, you know there is something more pushing against the wind, burning cheap gas and monotony until finally the motor comes to life. When I say love, you know it will carry us through, pushing against the wind, burning cheap gas and monotony, the smell of a dead skunk and breath fogging up our faces. When I say love, you know it will carry us through the desert, wind howling like a mad woman, the smell of a dead skunk and breath fogging up our faces. Nothing romantic about being on a motorcycle with the desert wind howling like a mad woman. And still, we ride for the pleasure of going. Nothing romantic about being on a motorcycle. But then, when I say life, you know what it is made of. And we ride for the pleasure of going. Keeping up with the beats the rhythm on the road. When I say life, you know what it is, made of steel skin, rubber and plastic. Is it only a machine? Thank you. Uh, so I have one last poem to offer and it is also a motorcycle poem. Uh, Jenna said in her introduction uh, that uh, I motorcycle the back roads of California with my husband. And uh, uh, I am a pillion rider as of now. Uh, motorcycling two up, I feel, is such a harmonious way to engage with each other, to engage with nature as well as with the self. Um, motorcycling is poetry in motion, I'll say. So let's go for a spin, shall we? The poem is called Riding. My husband and I are riding the back roads again. Going nowhere special, we motor down the old stage road at our own pace. The late sun shifting behind the clouds, its light retracing the horizon. Our motorcycle carries us through a time capsule, each minute like a glacier cascading in slow motion. Melting into an exquisite moment, we glide, almost levitate off the ground, uninterrupted, unstoppable, downshifting into one corner, revving up for another, our eyes trailing the ridge of the road. 
the darkening outline of the coast oak keeping us centered. Our shadow bodies projecting on the smooth asphalt, shoulder to shoulder, drifting in and out of ourselves, we sway to the rhythm of the rolling wheels under us until the salt air strikes us awake. I lift my head up like the doe at the edge of the hills. Does she feel a deep longing to turn around and start over? A sudden sweep, my gaze like a creek tumbles on its way to the sea. We ride by the Pescadero Bluffs, with waves scurrying like school kids at the end of the bell. At the end of the road, we turn towards home. With so much to love and so little time, but content with the sum of these things, we keep on riding. Thank you. And thank you everyone for listening. Over to you, Jenna. Well, thank you. Now I want to ride a motorbike. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you so much. Such a wide variety of poems from everyone. Uh, so our next poet ah, is Tony. So Tony Press tries to pay attention and sometimes he does. Uh, his story collection, Crossing the Lines was published by Big Table. His e-chap book of poems was published by Right Hand Pointing. He claims two pushcart nominations, 12 years in the same high school classroom and 25 criminal trials. He enjoys Bristol in England and Oaxaca in Mexico, but absolutely adores Brisbane, California. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. My words tonight will pretty much all take place, if you will, in the northern part of the county, Colma, Daly City, Pacifica, South City, Brisbane. On Maury Point. Surfboards on a fence. The sea is calm today, and thus, so are we. We sit, backs cradled by the bench, and talk of tonight and tomorrow, but not of yesterday. We are not ready to speak of yesterday. November. No hiding permitted after Day of the Dead. November light spares nothing. Shadow and sun adhere to designated borders. The air cracks. Across Washington Street, a stooped wife reaches deep into the trunk of a dusty Taurus, hauling to the sidewalk a silver walker. Now the husband, grabbing the chilled metal bars, navigates the 30 steps to the clinic entrance, his wife straining to brace the weighted glass doors. Yesterday in my classroom, exuberant Fatima, only four months arrived from El Salvador, play swooned over my handsome son who smiled from a color photo on my wall. I see my future, he is my future. Turns out they share birthdays, though Andy has had 11 more. She has a point. Gleefully again, he is my future. From my window, I see the husband disappear. Even Thanksgiving is gone. Autumn's clarity takes me by the hand, forces my attention to the faux Mexican brick medical building that looms against the blue Pacific sky, demands my lips echo hers. I see my future. He is my future. Star of Leo. I walked that night San Bruno Mountain, nothing else to do. The first stars appeared and among them I found a new one, brilliant, beautiful, bold. Today that sweet child in his open casket, who builds such things? Leo his name was, would have been, was. A new lion among the heavens, smiling down, a bit of comfort, Another week and I return to the path, this time a blue sky, sunny day, no stars. Someone once told me, don't worry, the stars are always there. 
she is gone too. Sweet and bitter, bitter and sweet. Colma Walk. We walked the graveyard today and saw a group of five sitting on the grass, wrapped in blankets this breezy Sunday, each person sitting within three or four yards of the same tombstone. We continued walking. The five appeared, though we could not say for certain, appeared to be a family, perhaps a mother and four children, two in their 20s, two younger, but perhaps not, perhaps a mother granddaughter, her child, her child's spouse, and their children, or not to be sure, for it could have been five friends, companions, aunts, uncles. We had no way to know and no need. We walked on, reached the corner, quickly debated, shall we do the whole path or just turn back? We chose the short way and began the uphill route. Except for the group of five, we had seen exactly two people, both groundskeepers, one raking, one driving a green cart, those two plus six squirrels, six squirrels and two large noisy crows. Approaching the group, we saw them now standing, circling the grave, standing and holding hands. We could not yet hear, but wondered if they were praying as we could see lips moving, bodies swaying. We kept walking, it's what we do. Closer still, we realized they were singing without a boom box or any musical instrument, just their voices drifted toward our waiting ears. At first we thought we recognized the song and each whispered the title, but quickly knew we were wrong. We did not know this song, our hearts told us, but we wanted to, so we sat nearby. If they noticed us, they made, if they noticed us, they made no sign. They sang, we listened. They sang, we marveled and we wondered. They sang, we listened, we held hands held hands before we even knew we were holding hands. We had come to the cemetery to walk, to talk a little, to be by each other's side. We had come to this place, this place neither city nor country, this place for the living, this place for the dead, this place, this place like no other place, this place no different from any other place. All places the same place. This place, this group singing this song, a song we did not know, yet would never forget. A song we did not know, yet would never forget. Hmm. De hecho, it is true. Immigrant family, first language Spanish, Central America, close knit and hard working and all that, but very little money, almost no money and they have 11 kids, 11 crammed together in a fog shrouded house. You know the story, right? Maybe, 11 kids and now 11 college diplomas, truth. Grand opening on Commercial Avenue. White canvas tarps cover the day's labor, paint guns and toolboxes tucked away. Cars pose along the east wall, noses pointing north, the proud Mustang raised just a bit higher. Spit clean and spotless, the E and S auto body shop. You could, hit a me you could eat a meal off this floor and some children will. Tonight, rented tables, eight chairs each, Winnie the Pooh balloons, three broad boards stretched across sawhorses, sagging with chicken, rice, beef, beans, bread, and more rice. The service counter this night swept free of estimates, work orders, insurance forms, transformed to a full bar. Nothing held back, nothing held back. Bottles for function, not for show. Steel buckets bursting with ice, beer, soda. A body shop makes a good dance hall. Cavernous, an aircraft carrier. Giant speakers blast from all corners. Lights flash and rotate. Machine fog shimmers in the glow. Three, four, five languages. Owners old and new. One babe in arms clutching with both hands her very first pink plastic bottle. Her wide eyes dilating beneath pure ebony lashes. Her perfect white shoes could hang from the mirror of a cherry 57 Chevy. Three, four, five languages. Oblando de Puebla and Seoul, Calexico, Long Beach. New owners from Mexico. Old owners, now new friends, Korea. 
borders and oceans in the self same breath. Kids scramble like puppies, pinballing into soft ants, laughing uncles, hard walls, stopped only by exhaustion, swooped up, tucked into corners, blanketed under winter coats. Adults dance, teens kiss, teens kiss, adults dance. Y todo sustana blondo. It's a sound stage now. Hollywood could shoot a movie, MTV a video. But Monday, back to a body shop, quality on Commercial Avenue. Tonight, we speak of Puebla and Seoul. Tonight, we dance. Tonight, we kiss. Puebla remains 2,300 miles away, and that's just in miles. Hablando de Puebla, y bailando, y besando, y esperando. And one more very short one. Equinox and solstice. Waking up once more, the painful task of dropping yesterday's myth. It is how you are looking that determines what you see. Pay attention. Look not for the time. It is only imagined. Be the moment. This is where we are, the middle between extremes. Arise and embrace. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tony. I, my rusty Spanish, I was trying to understand some of that. Uh, but our final reader is, yep, here you go, uh, Hilary Cruz Mejia. And uh, so Hilary Cruz Mejia is a Latinx immigrant from Puerto de Estapa, Guatemala, a first generation college student and a queer poet. Poetry with its rhythms and alliterations has been a healing process through her trans transition in the US. Hillary is working on her first poetry book where she encourages readers to find the guidance of self-transcendence in their lives and to wear the colors of her proud soul. Hello everyone, so I'm Hillary. I'm a little bit nervous. I'm so honored to be surrounded by great poets. I'm just a 20 year old and I'm a little bit shy. Um, even though I may seem very extrovert. Um, but yeah, so I'm Hillary. Um, I'm from Guatemala, I came to the US um, almost five years ago, haven't been back, which is sad. Um, but yeah, so um, I will allow you to get to know myself through my poems. And the first one is called I am the cosmic rebellion of my ancestors. My thoughts riot and I listen. I am understanding them. I inquire, I travel, and my thoughts form a line. They calm down. And I question the external in the reflection of what is not normal. I, this brown human flesh, this Latina soul, the indigenous spirit, and the lesbian that doesn't shut her mouth. I am the woman that, has, that wasn't born to please. Your sexual fantasies, your exotic tastes, your conservative brain. And so I wonder, and I write. I am writing. Por las que nos crecieron y las vidas que nos quitaron. The wings that they grew and the lives they took away from us. I am writing for you. I am writing to make the Congress tremble. I am writing for you, for anonymous mother's names. To make the Patrick tremble, I am writing. I, this wild, restless, radical, strong, brown woman. Um, so yeah, so that's the first one. Um, when I was writing this poem, I had many thoughts. Um, and one of them, it's the fear uh, of me cutting my hair my hair. Um, I cut my hair, I'll say like almost two years ago. It was very, very long. Uh, I was so scared of cutting my hair because I felt that if like cutting my hair would like, uh, it, I don't know, it was like, what if I cut my, if I cut my hair, I'll be cutting the, 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 the thing that I have, the connection with my land, uh, with the beliefs. Um, so, so yeah, um, the other reason why I was so scared, it was because I was scared of people um, thinking that I was a boy. Um, and because of God in my hair, people thinking I want to be a boy. Um, and I feel that in 
most of my poems, I try to let people know I am not a boy. <laughs> I am a woman and, um, and yeah, um, I am this Latina soul. This other poem, it's called Eight Number. I will, um, um, I'll read it to you. And um, I'll tell you in a little bit um, the reason why I wrote this one. A number. I am who loses the sense of the absent, who has left but will return, who doesn't plan to live in the absolute, who protects herself from the cold and travels in a bicycle, serpentine, cautious, in search of what history has stolen from me. I am who lives in the land of my ancestor, your ancestors, and still gets called foreigner. Um, I came to the U.S. as a refugee, um, and when we left the airport with my sister and the agent that was doing all the documents for us, like we arrived to the Miami, Miami airport and the first thing they asked, I didn't know any English back then, uh, and the first thing they asked, what's your alien number? The only thing I understood was alien. I was like, am I an alien? How come? Um, and it made me feel so, so weird that someone called me an alien. And um, from there, like before it was, am I an alien? And then time passed in the US and alien became, you're, you don't belong here. Alien became uh, brownness. It's not the cutest one in this land. And so then I try to uh, embrace the alien word and, and show it as, as something great, right? I am an alien, um, but I am not just an alien. I am, I am from this land, right? And we all are. And coming from another country doesn't make a big difference. Um, I do eat different things probably. But not that different. Um, um, this other poem um, is called Of the Days I Think, um, and I'm gonna share it with you in Spanish and in English. Uh, in Spanish, it's called De los Días que me acuerdo de vos. The literal translation will be Of the Days I Remember You. Um, but yeah, De los Días que me acuerdo de vos. El café se enfría, el escalofrío recorre hasta las piernas. El visitante se desespera, la tormenta se aleja. El minuto de silencio se convierte en años de remordimiento. El azúcar ya no endulza y las golondrinas se los olvida la canción. Y el cuerpo se te llena de tinta, tenés tinta roja en la cara, en las manos, en la espalda. Y el café se convierte en el escalofrío de los años. Tu piel en el adorno de cualquier bazar. El café se entibia, las piernas se congelan y la miel se te regresa a la boca. La dulzura de las casas viejas. El tiempo vuela, el aire te embalsa de frambuesas y yo ya no quiero esconderte. Sangre de serpiente envenenada. No, en inglés. Um, of the days I think, um, the coffee gets cold. The shiver runs up to the legs. The visitor disappears. The storm recedes. The minute of silence becomes the years of remorse. Sugar no longer sweetness. Swallows forget the sun and your body gets filled with ink in your face, in your hands, in your back. And the coffee becomes the shivers of the years. Your skin in the ornament from any bazaar. The coffee gets warm. Your, leg, your legs get cold and the honey comes back to your mouth the sweetness of the old houses. Time begins to fly, the air to fill you with raspberries, and I don't want to hide you anymore, poison serpent blood. Um, I talk about um, serpents, um, <laughs> um, and it's a very important symbol. Uh, I think in many cultures, um, um, but the symbol that I, and I, the serpent represents um, rebirth, right? Uh, creation. Um, and yeah, and I think um, 
coming to the U.S. It's uh, for me um, was like becoming a new person, um, but also holding the things from my past, my memories, and and the new things that I I will be discovering. Um, so yeah. Um, what else to tell you? I have another poem. Um, I write off them. Uh, um, and I do write in Spanish and in English. So this other one, I will also share it with you in Spanish and in English. Um, and it's cold or silent pain. And before I share it with you, I would like to share the link um, with you. Um, I link Casineto, uh, the poet Loret of Samantha Okani. She published um, three of my um, poems in this online magazine. And there you can find three poems of mine. And there is, one, there is the one that I will be um, sharing with you. And it's called Nuestro Dolor Silencioso, or Silent Pain. Para encontrar la paz en el caos social, para encontrar la paz, la paz en el caos mental, para encontrar la paz en los rincones de la habitación. Nunca olvidaremos que su interés en la paz para nuestros civiles mayas estaba en un cuarto oscuro. Para encontrar la paz en una tierra que está regentada por viejos blancos, que bailan al son de nuestra marimba, que trasladan el caos y el dolor a una oficina que llena sus cajones con dinero. Dinero para ya no vivir en la posición seria de hambre en el mundo. Nos dijeron que se firmó el acuerdo de paz, que la pena de muerte nunca volverá. Sin embargo, acuerdan a matar a aquellos que no imponen su voluntad a sus estilos de ropa modernas y a sus ideologías persuasivas. Que hay paz en nuestras ciudades, que nunca nos matarán, pero nos callan la boca. Llamándonos locos por protestar, por los nombres, por nuestros silenciosos recuerdos. Y entonces cuestiono el poder, la ambición en tus manos. Alzo la voz por el genocidio 1981-1983. No se puede olvidar con una varita mágica. Te alzo la voz, querida tierra de la eterna primavera. Levanto mi mano a la altura de mi hombro, de la misma manera que lo hice desde que tenía cinco años, sin saber que soy parte de la banda de los malentendidos. Sacrifico mis manos por la esperanza de honrar los nombres de nuestros antepasados. Sacrifico mi corazón por el toque de Madre Tierra. Protesto contra tu corrupción, las ilusiones de tu patriotismo, para encontrar la paz en nuestros bosques, para encontrar la paz en nuestra alma, para visualizar nuestro futuro sin sangre en tu espada. So now in English. Um, or silent pain. <clears throat> To find peace in social chaos, to find peace in mental chaos, to find peace in the corners of the room. We will never forget that your interest in peace of our Mayan civilians was in a dark room. To find peace in a land that is run by all males that dance at the sauna for marimba, that transmits chaos and pain to an office that fills its drawers with money, the money to no longer live in the serious position of the world's hunger. They told us the peace agreement was signed, that the death penalty will never come back, yet they agreed to kill us. They don't impose their will to their modern clothes, not their persuasive ideologies. That there is peace in our cities, that they will never kill us, yet they shut our mouths. You call us crazy for protesting, for the names, for more silent memories. And so I question the power, the ambition on your hands. And I raise my voice for the genocide 1981 to 1983. Cannot be forgotten with a magic wand. I raise my voice to you, dear eternal springland. I raise my hand to my shoulders, hey, in the same way that I did since I was five years old, without knowing that I am part of the misunderstood band. I sacrifice my hands for the hope of honoring my ancestor's name. I sacrifice my heart for the touch of Mother Earth. I protest against your corruption, delusions, your patriotism, to find peace in our forest, to find peace in our soul, to visualize our future without blood in your soul. Thank you, everyone. Oh.
Oh, thank you, Hilary. Oh, oh, every time everyone ends with such a powerful poem, I can't move on to the next person. Uh, but uh, thank you, everyone who read. Uh, we will now do the uh, panel portion. So if you have any questions for the poets, uh, feel free to add it into the chat and then they will discuss. So let me just quickly bring all of our poets back. Okay, uh, so I'll kick off with the first question. Oh, let me, so you can see me as well. Okay, let's kick off. First question is, uh, can you talk about poetry during COVID and what has your writing experience been like during quarantine? <laughs> you know, I talked about how some poems have a short half-life and some endure. And I wrote a bunch of poems, pandemic related, and they, their half-life is like zero. Um, <laughs> um, I, it's hard, you know, I, sometimes you write, for myself, I write poetry to try to process my feelings and my feelings were just too raw. I finally wrote one good one, but um, in terms of writing, um, it, the main thing COVID has done for me is, is brought me Zoom. I, I have gatherings like this. I've, I've chatted with people in Australia and Great Britain and India and, and um, plus all over the United States. And, and we, you know, we have visitors right now. I know at least one from Connecticut. I don't know where everyone else is from. But um, in a way, it, the, the world has gotten wider as I've had to you know, shelter in place here. So um, there's good and there's bad. I mean, I, I want it to be over. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. This, this has gotta get over, it. but it hasn't been all bad. Yeah, no, there's nothing like the energy of um, a live poetry audience. Um, you know, it's not quite, quite the same as a rock concert, but you know, uh, actually having people uh, listen to people respond, you know, as you read a poem, that, that that's very compelling and I, I love that experience and I'm really looking forward to it, to uh, having that experience again. But I wanna say about the pandemic is that, you know, it, it takes me a while to process anything, you know, like some of my poems harken back 50, 60 years, you know, and they just showed up yesterday, right? Um, so I, the pandemic <clears throat> hasn't registered yet, uh, except that, you know, the uh, it wasn't, for me, I didn't experience it as a, a, uh, a personal affront, I, you know, but I, 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 it was a public event that affected uh, millions of people and, you know, impacted and destroyed the lives of millions of people. And what my real response to it was just the, my, my horror and outrage uh, about what was going on in Washington, about the total refusal of the, the Trump administration uh, to do anything uh, positive that would, you know, help people um, who weren't extremely wealthy already uh, to um, weather th this incredible, um, incredibly difficult time. And so, um, you know, it, if anything, it, it made me even more rabid in my uh, dismay vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the political situation in our country, made me even more aware of how uh, corrupt and, um, uh, and uh, uncaring so many uh, politicians uh, who present, pretend to represent people really are. So that, that was my response to the pandemic. Well, in for me, Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, was someone speaking? You go, Monica, please. Oh, okay. Uh, I, for me, I think uh, um, a little bit of what Lee said, it takes me a while to process certain things. So in my case, more than processing the pandemic through poetry, it has been the other way around uh, because the gift of time has been so wonderful during the shelter in place, especially those few months that we had, um, 
it really made a significant difference and allowed me to process my poetry through this time I found um, uh, building a new routine uh, to adjust with the new normal and just sitting down to practice reading or listening or writing poems uh, with a getting into the zone what they call with a work perspective not not just a thing you do on the side uh, so putting giving dedicated hours to poetry uh, and other thing was um, the online poetry open mics I didn't really have an excuse anymore not to attend poetry uh, nights like too much traffic weather is too cold too hot it gets too dark on the way back <laughs> so I didn't have any of those excuses and uh, that allowed me to just um, embrace poetry uh, for real and uh, really uh, pay attention to, to all of it. And uh, one more thing that I uh, felt was uh, in some ways uh, it, it was bothering what was going on outside, uh, again, like Lee mentioned, but I think poetry was also... I think very freeing uh, in a certain way. It, in general, poetry, even if it is writing about uh, politics or writing about um, any any difficult times going around us, I feel that it still uh, frees your mind and just frees you from any kind of institution or system, at least for for a little while. So that's my takeaway from this. Yeah, I was thinking about just how it's affected my writing in general in the last year plus. Um, and I think I found another excuse perhaps to not write as much as I would like because I've, um, I, and I'm super fortunate. I've, you know, I've been just, I have everything I need. Everything's good. And I know it's not the same for lots of people, but I haven't gone anywhere. You know, I live in Brisbane at the top of the county. I've been to Mountain View in Santa Clara County four times. And up until three weeks ago, that's that's as far as I'd gone. I have uh, three weeks ago, I drove across the bay for the first time to visit my son in Fremont. It was exciting. Uh, I've not been in San Francisco and I can walk to San Francisco quickly. Um, those things are going to change. But it had an effect on because a lot of my writing has to do with place. I don't have to be, certainly if I'm traveling far you know, internationally or, or in, you know, I'm in Iowa or Wisconsin or, or something like that, that always helps. But just not being, being in the same place, I think had, had a, I mean, I'm not, you know, I have no complaints, but in terms of writing, I think that affected how, how much I wrote in particularly poetry in the past year. I agree with, with you, Tony. Like um, when the pandemic started, I kind of began to put excuses on, on writing. Uh, I haven't um, write as much as I used to. Um, and at some point I blamed the pandemic because I was like, it's your fault that I'm not writing as much as I wish. Um, but I, if I, think deeper on that, it's probably something that I'm trying not to communicate with myself, right? Um, and again, what's happening um, to, to other communities, um, whether we like it or not, it affects us because we have friends, we have family. Um, and yeah, I don't know, I've been, I haven't been writing a lot, um, but it's, but it has opened me the doors to come to poetry readings. So um, it's a great thing and it's also balance. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've got a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, first one is, uh, will the poets, will, will everyone miss the extra writing time when your commute returns? <laughs> well, you heard my answer. <laughs> and what's a commute? Right. I don't have a commute, but <clears throat> I do have a teenage daughter uh, who travels a lot of places but doesn't have a driver's license. So I, I am her Uber driver. And uh, so that, that puts me, or used to put me on the road a lot. And uh, I, I'm not looking forward to that. But, um, you know, I, I think it's inevitable. 
I definitely wouldn't miss the extra writing time. Uh, I think I'm nocturnal. So most of my poems <laughs> happen after midnight. So <laughs> I don't think I'll miss them. <laughs> You're lucky. I think I write more when I'm in a bar walking and looking at people outside my house, my room. So I don't think I'll miss being in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I won't miss it either. Oh, I do not like my commute, so everyone's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do any of the poets offer workshops or teach? I take lots of workshops, you know, I mean, I, I used to be a workshop junkie, you know, but, um, you know, I somehow I, I don't know if I really have, you, you might call this humility, but uh, I, I call this timidity. Um, you know, I don't really feel like uh, uh, I have the, I mean, there's so much to learn about writing, right? I mean, you know, it takes a long time. And if you want to be a poet, you have to have patience. And, um, and I, I know the expectation when you go into a workshop is that you get two or three fabulous poems out of, uh, you know, the 15 minutes that you spend with the poet. Um, I, unfortunately, that's generally not true. And um, you might get the, the kernel of a really good poem, but, you know, it, it just... You know, it, it's not just the workshops, it's, you know, everything you do, everything you read, everything you write, all the little journal entries you make, uh, the letters you send, the emails that you respond to. I mean, those are all opportunities to listen to that voice inside that is the source of the poet, poetry. And that is really not your voice, but, you know, some, something much larger. Um, and, uh, but, but which is very quiet. So, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of practice to be able to listen to that voice on a regular basis. Uh, in terms of giving workshops, I, about once a year for the last many years, I've given a writing workshop, not just poetry, uh, at the San Francisco Buddhist Center in the Mission, where I'm oh, cool. affiliated with. And uh, that's always fun. And, and, as as is often the case, it's self interest because if I lead a workshop, I'm going to get a lot of writing done that day and and think of a lot of things that I wouldn't have thought about otherwise. And it's generally fun for folks, but I'm I'm not uh, I'm not MFA uh, certificate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I I I'm an undergrad student, so still getting my education there. So <laughs> we're always learning, you know. I mean, always be beginning. You know, that's that's one of those Buddhist uh, sayings that I, uh, you know, beginner's mind. You know, Zen mind, beginner's mind is a book by Suzuki Roshi, um, which I recommend just for you know it, its spiritual uh, value. But uh, you know, it, it's a a lesson that writers can always. Uh, uh, refer to, you know, especially when you get stuck, because, you know, it's, it's not easy to write a good poem, and you're always trying to write something better and deeper and uh, um, more reflective of, of your reality and of ultimate reality. So, um, yeah, just keep at it is <laughs> the best I can tell you. I'll say I think uh, uh, the open mics that I attend on a regular basis, uh, even if you pick three open mics that happen per month. Uh, they are workshops in themselves. You get to hear such amazing, fabulous, widely published poets every month. And that's a treat, uh, a masterclass in itself, I'd say. Uh, I, have, I have been attending open mics for a while now, and um, some of them are hosted by um, former poet laureates or current poet laureates. And uh, it's... Mm, you don't get this chance very often to hear your local poets and what they are thinking right now, what they are writing about right now. If a wildfire is happening outside my window and I can see the orange sky, 
there is someone else going through the exact same thing, but they have such a different perspective. And sometimes I may not be able to express what I'm feeling, um, the suffocation or uh, the, the difficult feelings are, are not easy for everyone to express. Uh, but another poet is doing that for me. And uh, that's a great learning, I would say. So I'm, I'm a big fan of open mics. And I will, I'll, for any beginner poet also, I would really uh, suggest that if they get a chance uh, and one, one place uh, to go to get to know about open mics is the libraries. Your local libraries are a gem. Uh, that's how I found my first poetry open mic, which was hosted by at the Belmont Library. And uh, libraries often host wonderful uh, literary events and they welcome poet laureates and let you know about them. So uh, they, these are some, some beautiful spaces to have on the go workshops and just learn every, every moment that you're taking in. I can't wait until libraries are totally open again, you know, it's such a, such a loss, you know, especially for old people like myself, you know, uh, who uh, like to go in and just hang out with the books, you know, and so uh, they are, they give such comfort, you know, I mean, because as writers, we're in conversation with all those other people who wrote all those books, right? Uh, we learn from them, we respond to them. And uh, we need them, you know, to give us context and models and uh, inspire us. So, yeah, I want those libraries open as soon as possible. I've just posted uh, two links in the chat, one for the book that Lee recommended. So you can, if you want to place a hold to our library catalog and read it. Uh, second one is the library haiku workshops that are happening Friday and next Tuesday. Those are free if you want to brush up on your haiku writing. And cool. I guess semi-official announcement is that the library is reopening for San Mateo County Libraries. Uh, we are reop <laughs> reopening uh, starting next, next Thursday, the 22nd. So we'll be on a schedule where Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the library will be open to the public for browsing. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday will be curbside pickup still. So if you're interested, I can post the, the announcement in the chat and we can get back to talking about poetry. Uh, okay. We have another question. Uh, what do you dream about for the future of poetry? Oh, jeez. I'll be happy to throw my hat in the ring for more internet poetry. I, I you know, I, I came of age um, reading little tiny literary magazines that were so hard to get your hands on, you know, and college libraries might have them, but you couldn't find them anywhere and you couldn't afford to buy all these, you know, subscribe to them. But with the internet, poetry everywhere. I'm reading so much more and it's so much wonderful stuff. And some of them are internet journals and some of them are just websites that accumulate poetry. But personally, it gives me an outlet to publish some of my things, but equally it exposes me to so many um, wonderful poems and, and such a variety. I, I think the future of poetry is on the web. That's true, but you know what that reflects is the fact that <clears throat> there are so many more poets now than there were 30 years ago, 40 years ago. When I moved to LA, there were six poets. Um, that was in 1972. And uh, they all met once a week at uh, uh, the Beyond, no, it was, it was Beyond. Beyond Baroque. Yeah, Beyond Baroque or um, uh, Baki, uh, Baki Bookstore. I can't, uh, Papa Bach, Papa Bach Bookstore uh, in West LA. And, um, you know, and they, they were kind of lonely. And you can tell because the, their poems were, I mean, they were funny, but they were also dark. And, um, you know, uh, they had that sense of being, you know, really marginal. Uh, and of course, it's Hollywood, you know, so, you know, anybody who is serious about literature is automatically marginal. But, um, you know, since then, the, the poetry world has exploded. I mean, we see that in San Francisco or the San Francisco area because there are, you know, the universities and, 
you know, the beat tradition and all that kind of stuff. But even in LA, uh, which is not fertile to ground, you'd think, for poetry, you know, there's been a huge explosion of magazines and reading venues and uh, uh, web scenes and all kinds of stuff um, because people are hungry for truth and for um, exploring the deeper la layers of themselves and, you know, their reality. So, I, uh, yeah, I think this is a, an incredible time to be a poet. I mean, the, the one of the drawbacks is there are so few, so many voices, it's hard to be heard. But on the other hand, there are plenty of people that you can, you know, uh, you can be with, you know, and uh, who share your, your interests and, uh, uh, and provide support and encouragement and enlightenment. You know? And the good thing is that everybody's looking for something different to read. Um, yeah. Yeah. There are so many different voices now, you know, so many different perspectives and points of view. I mean, uh, I got into trouble for saying to about somebody that um, they, uh, you know, I write reviews too. Okay, so I said somebody was writing, uh, sounding the death knell of the white male hipster, you know, the kind of the beat paradigm. And uh, he got really mad at that, about that. But, you know, it's true you know i mean there are still plenty of old white guys out there you know tony and joe and i you know we kind of represent that cadre but there are there are younger people from you know different backgrounds different ethnicities different gender affiliations um and uh who have important things to say and they are finally getting the chance to say them and i think that's a wonderful thing Monica or Hillary, did you want to chime in a bit more or? It's a very broad subject. <laughs> uh, that, I mean, I'm just uh, still working on my craft and uh, listening and reading other poets has, ha has been helping me a lot. Uh, so I think just on a lighter note, I, I feel that when the world is a safer place, I hope that we can ha use the public spaces and be together as poets again. Uh, one of the things I'd like to see is like we have uh, pizza with the police. I have, I hope we have pizza with the poets someday. <laughs> that will be something fun and <laughs> quite interesting. Yeah. 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 All I can do is agree with with all of you. Um, yeah. It's. Um, it's the dream, right? To to see more people uh, speaking up and being confident about uh, their talent. And that's the other thing. You are talented. You just need to remind yourself that you are um, and getting to practice, right? If you want a great uh, poem, practice. Um, I started writing letters, complaints to God, complaints to the ocean, complaints to life. So start writing complaints, start writing why you are angry, why, start to question yourself and then maybe poetry will come. Uh, the plaint is a very old, ancient, uh, character assassination is also, you know, a kind of complaint. Uh, and uh, I, I love that particular version of the plaint myself. But yeah, uh, it's, you know, a lot of people think that poetry has to be positive, uh, and there are plenty of things to be negative about in this, this our reality. And so I, I encourage all my friends and relations, you know, to write nasty, mean, vicious poems. You know, uh, I, uh, I, I especially like the poems of people. We haven't talked about who our favorite poets are, but I, you know, I, I love some of the old guys like Catullus. And, and Marshall, you know, not only were they were nasty, they were scabrous, you know, they, they, they said really kind of shockingly rude sexual things about the habits of their neighbors and, uh, and friends who also happened to be wealthy aristocrats like Marshall and Catullus and who had, you know, bodyguards, you know, it was all, it's like, you know, the warring families, you know, uh, starting a war, uh, a mafia war, you know, with poetry back in Rome, but, um, but cool stuff, very cool. 
got one last question. And I think it's a good one to, to finish up. Uh, question is, uh, what is next for you? I know the answer to that, but I've been shooting my mouth off. So maybe I'll let the other people talk. Okay, I'll talk. It's you, Lee. <laughs> I, I'm writing a memoir and uh, I've been writing it for over 10 years, you know? I figured, well, I started when I was 66, no, 64, and figured I wasn't old enough to write a memoir. But, um, you know, in the course of time, I've become old enough to write a memoir. And, uh, and I'm almost done with a first draft, you know? And now I only have, you know, seven or eight more drafts to get through before, you know, it's publishable. So we'll, you know, we'll see. We'll see. That's what I'm doing. Well, in that case, I'll say that maybe I'll finish the novel. Um, <laughs> it's a uh, first draft was about four or five years ago. Uh, a year ago, I declared in front of a whole bunch of writing buddies that I was going to do it in 2020. And apparently it didn't happen, uh, but it could. It's still, <laughs> still, you know, there are moments when it's, it's going well. And I would love to. I would love to have had written my novel. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm planning on publishing my first poetry book. Um, I uh, I kind of said the same thing um, in 2020. I was like, maybe I'll have a lot of time that in uh, shelter at home. Uh, I did have a lot of time to just lay down on my bed and look at the ceiling and think of it. Um, yes. and, but yeah, so um, writing my first poetry book, like I have some poems, um, but like putting it out there, I think it's the next step. Great. Yeah, I think I echo Hillary's thoughts. Uh, uh, in the future, I would love to come out with uh, a chapbook or a a poetry book of my own as well. But uh, right now is I'm just focusing on uh, the poetry that I write and if I can diversify as much as possible and uh, improve on uh, the craft, uh, that's what I'm focusing on and looking at. So yeah, paying attention to all of that so that I can see that future happening soon. Great, very nice. Good luck to the both of you. You guys, you, Hillary and Monica, you're the future of poetry here, and I look forward to uh, watching it develop. Yeah, me too. exactly. Mm. Yeah. I don't know what's next for me. Watching you guys is probably what's next. <laughs> <laughs> exciting. I mean, there's a new, there's such new life in poetry now, thanks to Amanda Gorman and right, right. Um, People, it's newly energized, and I'm just, a, just gonna sit here in the audience and uh, see it happen. And I'll keep writing poetry, uh, but I cannot predict what's next for me. I've never known what's next for me. I, I, mm -hmm. The arc of my career, I've been a writer since high school, uh, and I, I published my first book in 1972. And I went through a whole series of published books. I mean, you know, big New York publishers, and then, Somewhere along the line, I got kind of dis tired of that. Um, started self-publishing and then moved into poetry. I, I've always been writing poetry, but I, I, I just totally embraced it in, um, about 15 years ago. And I'm still there, and I, but tomorrow, I don't know, my head could get turned in some other direction, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> but, Hillary and Monica, you, you go. <laughs> I will just watch. Yeah. I'd love to learn, learn from people like Hillary and Monica. You know, the, those, um, uh, I, I think it has something to do with the fact that, you know, basically I'm a sprinter, but I love long poems and, and people who, uh, that can, you know, build a poem and keep going, you know, for two, three pages, you know, and, and find some sort of structure that will, hold the whole thing together, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, if I have to write a poem that long, generally I have a, a huge story to tell, but there are other ways of doing it. And I think the Amanda Gorman poem 
for example, at the inauguration is a good example of that. You know, it's a, it's kind of a, a prayer and an invocation and, you know, lots of other stuff all, you know, sprinkled with historical facts, but still at the same time, uh, you know, kind of uh, it's a, a quality of voice and the quality of projection. It's a bit like a sermon, I guess. That, that's, and um, that is uh, uh, a genre I have tried a few times, but have never succeeded at. So, you know, the, there's still always the future, right? Keep at it. Well, when it's 8.04, but listening to everyone has been amazing. Uh, thank you very much. For Are you going to cut us off now? Yes. No, that's, that's oh, right. If someone else has another question in the chat, but I think everyone's just going to thank you now. Looks like, thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, thank uh, everyone for coming. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, happy Poetry Month, right? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much, Jenna. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I will post the recording also so everyone can listen to you again. <laughs> sure. And just a shout out to Kalamu Shashe and uh, Eileen Casineto, always encouraging and uh, opening up these space, spaces of poetry for everyone. Yeah, great. And Lisa Rosenberg as well, former poet laureate. Oh, yes. There's Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Shout out to Lucia Legmeyer who encouraged me to write more poetry. Yeah. And I see my friend Diane Schenker, who, who gets the, the most distant uh, award because she's in New York City right now uh, watching. Wow. That's at, almost India, Leo. Uh, yeah, 11. <laughs> oh, oh, well, that, there's your mother. Right? Okay, never mind. <laughs> but in the continental United States, I'm giving the award to, to Diane because, and it's 11 o'clock there. I mean, my yeah. God, you know, Good fact, it's still up. All right. Yeah, it's amazing. So many poet friends have been here and family from India. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Oh, good night. Thank, Thank you, everyone.